Hey, John Horgan. Hi, George Johnson. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm in a different location uh, than usual. I am oh. in my girlfriend Valerie's apartment in, uh, in Tribeca in New York City. Tribeca, wow. Well, that's, that's, that's very swank. It is pretty swank, especially compared <laughs> to where I live. Oh. My, uh, my modest little bachelor pad in, uh, in Cold Spring, New York. Yeah. Yeah, God. Yeah, Tribeca. I have fond memories of when I lived in New York of walking around Tribeca at night. and you know, It was kind of this mix of, of desolate solitude where, where it hadn't been completely gentrified and then all these bustling restaurants filled with, filled with happy, bustling young people. Well, now it's just investment banker land it's uh it, you walk outside and it's it's all these super fit type a males and females pushing their their babies and and carriages that probably cost more than my prius <laughs> so wow that's a new thing the carriages that i mean that, that used to be what you associated with uh, park slope in brooklyn oh. It's very, it's very uh, family oriented around here, and it's great. Oh, that's, uh, that's right across... listening to you since I was there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's a park right out the window here yeah. that I can see, and with and it's filled with little kids. There's a school right over here. Beyond that, there's a there's a gigantic playing field where there are always all these little kids playing soccer oh. and baseball and all kinds of sports. Oh, that's it's great. Actually, yeah, it's actually really nice. So, yeah, it's nice to know they're carrying on future lineages of investment bankers. <laughs> when you put it that way, George, <laughs> I don't know. All these little, little future derivatives analysts. And, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they'll become poets and uh, well, poets I don't know. I, I envision a world, George, in which there are no derivatives traders. Oh, I have a God. dream. I have a dream. <laughs> this is about the time that war will end, I think. <laughs> yeah. yes, which well, I hope hope is sooner than we think. Uh, war will end before derivatives end. I'm pretty sure about that. Ah, yeah. Well, speaking of of which, I keep hearing good things about your book. Oh well, um, it's uh, you know it's kind of plugging along. Um, I got a, a long ride from a radio station here in New York, WNYC, that was oh, yeah. promoting it. Like uh, this one guy, Brian Lehrer, kept talking about it for months wow. it was it was fantastic and wow, wow I'm, that's uh, great. I'm actually giving a um a talk at a peace conference near albany august 17th and 18th wow. so if anybody out there in blogging heads land wants to come uh it should be pretty easy to find oh that's um, great so yeah war hasn't ended yet but um you know well, still, you've got the uh, idea out there yeah yeah <laughs> And uh, and I see that you have a big article in uh, in National Geographic that you've told us bits and pieces <laughs> oh, about over the years. Yes, this dates back to 2009. It's been 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 in, in the works for that many years. Well, congratulations on it on it uh, finally coming out. I read it this morning and I thought it was George. It was so much fun to read. And, oh, uh, good. It's a, and very it, different from what I usually write. Well, it's real, like, kind of, I don't know, macho adventure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's yeah. like, yeah, gonzo science writing. It's, yeah, I'm uh, on the edge of your seat, tearing across the Texas panhandle, chasing lightning storms with the, with the giant kahuna camera. Yeah, it was fun to do something really different like that. Yeah, um, you've got a knack for that kind of... Uh, Action journalism, George. Well, I have no idea, so maybe, yeah, maybe I'll, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I can get a book out of something like that. <laughs> well, give us, give us the, uh, give us the backstory. Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, so this guy, uh, uh, T Tim Samaras, this guy, this uh, uh, engineer from from the Denver area. He's, he's also a tornado chaser, but in recent years he's been uh, really concentrating on chasing lightning storms. And the idea is, uh, you know, they know from taking, um, you know, really high-speed photography, I mean video, and then slowing it down so they can take, you know, tens of thousands of frames of sec a second with these cameras called the phantoms. 
And when you do this, you can see that when lightning, like the, you know, the, the sequence is that it starts out with what they call a step leader that like comes from um, you know, like, like the sky and like it steps down, you know, zigzags down. You know, it look, what looks very, very slowly and gradually, but you know, this is all happening in a few milliseconds. And then, so it just kind of takes this, you know, semi-random, semi-structured zigzag trail down from the sky. They call that the stepped leader, and that's usually negatively charged electricity. And when it gets within a certain distance of the Earth, it's, um, you know, the charge is enough that it uh, pulls up a uh, surge of positive electricity from the Earth. And then when the two connect, you know, that's the moment really when the lightning the lightning strike is born, so it uh, sends down the feeler, and then it, and then uh, it, they, the, the other feeler comes up. The two connect, and then this huge amount of current comes surging up from the earth into the sky, and then it retraces the uh, ionized trail that was traced out by the downward step leader, and that's what you're seeing when you see lightning. So, so, so you don't up. actually, you're not seeing the bolt before that, before the circuit is completed. Right, right. You're not seeing any of that stuff. So you're just seeing the, uh, the uh, yeah, you don't see the stuff later at all unless you do slow motion, slow motion photography. I mean, you know, high speed and then slow it down, slow, slow motion photography. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so then it, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's cool. I, I had, I had no idea. So what you are actually seeing, I, I mean, our impression is that the lightning comes from the sky and goes down to the earth, but actually the yeah. uh, the circuit originally, uh, the lightning bolt actually starts from the earth and goes up into the clouds? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean the, the, the initiating event it starts from the clouds, you know, the step yeah. leader going down, but then what you actually see comes up from the earth. Yeah. And then after that, there are after flashes where it'll, you know, depending on all kinds of conditions where it'll, you know, flash flash up and down and, and you get this flickering you know, flickering effect and but but mostly for the for, for the large part what you see is lightning uh, descending from the sky is an optical illusion because it's this it's this almost simultaneous flash that's originating from the ground and going up but so fast that you would never sense it as either upward or downward but you know it just really just flashes and oscillates and then your brain kind of imposes um, you know what what it expects, which is the lightning coming down from the sky. And also, since the when the bolt's following up the you know the path that was carved out by the step leader, you know that has this sense of um, it, 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 like your brain sort of thinks of water, you know, going uh, like like tributaries feeding into the main stream, and it looks like tributaries or um, you know tri little tributaries of uh, lightning feeding into the main bolt. So all this stuff kind of contributes to the sense that the lightning striking from the, the um, sky to the ground, but it's actually more complicated. So this guy, he, this camera that he's using, oh, yeah. it should be sensitive, sensitive enough to capture the whole process? Yeah, the whole thing. So so right now, if you look at you, you can find a lot of these on YouTube, and a lot of them actually are things that Samaras himself took with the with the slower uh, 10,000 frames a second cameras. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> really and this slow. This one is a, milli a million frames a second? Theoretically capable of a million frames a second, hundreds of oh, thousands. And, that's uh, unbelievable. And so the idea is, that, so when you see these these other these uh, other videos, they're really cool. You see the step leader come down, and then suddenly there's just this blinding flash, and it blinds the camera because it's so powerful and it happens so fast. So you don't see any detail. Mm -hmm. And what he's hoping is, uh, if you do it at, at uh, hundreds of thousands to a million frames per second, you'll see the exact moment when the two connect, and maybe there's some kind of interesting pattern or structure that will tell you something about lightning that we don't don't know and there's quite a lot they don't know um, and the camera itself is just this wonderful kind of combination super high-tech Rube Goldberg contraption it was originally used uh, used after World War II at the Nevada test range and places like that to film um, above-ground explosions 
With and it. the way it works, it's, it's mechanical, so it has this huge tur The whole thing weighs, uh, you know, like a ton, close, approximately a wow. ton. And it has, uh, so he has it in the back of his trailer, you know, mounted permanently in that back there. Um, and then there's this turbine inside, you know, like yay, yay, big around as I put up my hands. Um, and then the turbine is spun around by uh, a tank of either compressed helium or compressed air. If you need to go really, really fast, you use compressed helium. Uh, but um, for slower speeds, I use air because it's cheaper, I guess. But anyway, so this compressed gas is causing this turbine to spin around thousands of RPM. And at the center of the turbine is a prismatic mirror. And it's taking the image coming in from the camera lens and then bouncing it onto a series of 80... Um, 80 separate little lenses that are each, in, in a sense, a separate little camera that are each coordinated so they take um, sequential, so they're getting like a sequential image. So the original camera, that was a strip of 35 millimeter film, and they would expose like 80 frames, and then, you know, you just have, you know, this tiny, tiny little, 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 little sequence of time, because each one was approximately a microsecond apart, so you have 80 microseconds of film. <laughs> And then, uh, and and that's when he first got learned of the camera and, and and was using it in this this company he works for. And then later he was able to buy it for for scrap as, as military surplus. Can, I, can I just worked. ask you something? Did, yeah. Was this camera by any chance built by Harold Edgerton? Oh, I I don't know. It's uh the company was. Uh, Oh, I'd have to look back at my article, but it's it's, it's in my article, the name of the company. But uh, well, the reason I, you've heard it of that commercial, it was a commercial product. Oh, so commercial product. Um, well, with a very limited audience, mostly of, probably just the U.S. government. Well, just just to fill in um, the viewers, uh, Harold mm -hmm. Edgerton is this legendary physicist at MIT, oh. who I think pretty much invented ultra high speed. Photography um, for oh. military purposes. Originally, he developed all the instrumentation for taking pictures. I think of the atomic bomb explosions, and then oh. um, and then the hydrogen bomb explosions. He built a a, a company that specialized in uh, instruments. I think not just um, visible images, but I think also uh, X-rays, other parts of the um, of the spectrum. And he also is the person who, you know, he developed these cameras and, and opened up this whole world of, um, of these uh, bizarre things that happen that we can never see because our, our vision oh, processing is too slow. Yeah. So one of the classic images is just the, um, the drop of milk hitting a surface right, and it right, splashes right. up and it forms this perfect crown with with little beads that look like pearls around the rim of the crown. Oh, I see. I've seen that are, are, are similar. Yeah, and, it's just like a whole different world when you get into this time scale. Yeah, and and um, and a, a bullet uh, going through an apple, a bullet. He did a lot of images yeah. of bullets. Bullets going through playing cards. I, yeah. I did this profile of him back in the... Um, the mid '80s, when I was working for this engineering ma magazine, IEEE Spectrum. Oh yeah. And uh, and he actually sent me a bunch of his images, and I have this beautiful photograph that he he sent me um, of a. Um, it's the moment when a football player, a kicker, it, his foot is striking a football, mm -hmm. and the football is still um, it's still in place, even though the toe is embedded deeply in it. And there's a little puff of dust coming off of the uh, football. That's the only uh, that's the only sign that the thing is going to go flying off, and that this impact wow. has been made. It's just, wow. and you know, it's black and white. That the shoe, the got the shoe of the kicker is really old fashioned looking. Uh, he's just oh, that's this, great. He's just this incredible character. So, yeah, because uh, yeah, we had this idea, you know, there's this whole new world when you get down to the microscopic level, and then you, you know, in space, and then, you know, showing what, when you get down to the micro, <laughs> micro, whatever you would call it, temporal space. And yeah, I mean, which, and, a, which is a huge industry now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, now I think they're down to, I don't know, femto and picoseconds. And, yeah, and, and a lot of it depends like on, well, like this camera which does, uh, 
Well, yes, yeah, so it's doing microseconds, but um, but it has really good, you know, real, really high resolution. Mm -hmm. So you can get cameras that fast commercially and, and probably faster, but um, you know, they tend not to expose too many pixels. So. And this so is electronic. I mean, it's is it yeah. He, so he retrofitted now? the yeah. He retrofitted the old film technology. Originally, he was trying to use it with the film, and then um, and then um, and then he retrofitted it uh, with electronic sensors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me, yeah. I, I just looked it up. The name of it is uh, it's, it's called the Beckman and Whitley One Ninety Two. A Beckman. Okay, so that's Beckman. not the. Uh, yeah, but I, I would I be surprised think... this guy wasn't involved in the company because this is this is a big company that you know did this. Uh, you know, they, they they made a lot of specialized equipment for recording things in you know extreme conditions like that. But it's yeah. really a trip to see this thing, and it's just such a behemoth that you have to aim the back of the trailer at the lightning storm. So you're pulling off on the side of all these farm roads in the middle of nowhere. And, Huge storms coming in and lightning striking everywhere, and, and um, it was pretty exciting. But he never, yeah, the thing was, and so this started in, I think it was 2009. It's possible it was 2008 when they first asked me to do the story, and because um, they had gotten on to this, and there was a photographer, um, a photographer, Karsten Peters, this really good uh, German, uh, just amazing National Geographic photographer, and he really wanted to do this do this story because he had, um, I think, yeah, I think he had done, gone with this guy on uh, light on uh, thunderstorm. I mean, tornado chases. So uh -huh. anyway, they asked me if I wanted to ride it. You know, I said sure. It sounds like a nice departure. But then, you know, like the first year, um, he he wasn't able to go out for some you know reason. I think he was still perfecting the camera. And then the second year, we went out. I went went out with him for. Oh, a few days, uh, two times during the during the summer, and he didn't get the shot. And then the agreement was with the magazine was that well, you know, it's pretty unlikely that he'll get the shot, and it's even more unlikely that he'll he would just happen to get it when you're there. But wouldn't that be great? And if not, yeah. it's still a good story, you know, just the story of the quest. So, so, uh, so I wrote it up as the story of the quest in 2000. Um, I guess that was 2009. Yeah, and then they, they accepted the story and paid for it and said, you know, this is fine. And then they came back and said, well, we just had a meeting and we thought that I mean, this is such a great story. We, we want to give them another another chance. So so I said, yeah, it's fine with me. You know, just you know, you know, we'll pay you extra for your you know extra time in the you know reporting and then revising the story. So so 2010 comes around and. And we're, you know, exchanging emails. Um, you know, Samaras has this list of people that, you know, he keeps surprised of his activities. And, and he was, there was some, he discovered some software glitch with the camera. So he's going all summer t working with uh, with a software engineer and trying to get this, this fixed. And then finally, you know, it was Labor Day weekend. And I thought, well, it's got to happen pretty soon because that's about the time the lightning season in the southwest comes to a close, and, and he just never got out. So 2009 was a bust. I mean, that was 2010 by then. 2010 was a bust. And then in 2011, that's when he got out again, and I rejoined him. And, and, uh, and yeah, and, and this time we went up to uh, this, this lightning. It's, it's essentially a lightning observatory on top of this 11,000-foot mountain in southern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, they shoot rockets up into charged clouds and induce lightning bolts. So he was figuring, well, at least he could go up there. And you know, the problem was getting lightning to stay in place long enough that he could aim the kahuna, which he calls it, the giant camera. And it takes a few seconds to fire up, you know, to spin up like a minute. And then once you spin it up to speed, you can only keep it spinning for just a little while so it doesn't melt. So there's all these constraints, and I thought, well, this way will eliminate a constraint because I can aim right at where they're they're shooting the rockets. And it's amazing when they shoot these rockets from this mountaintop, and they have wires attached to them, and then the lightning is like uh, summoned from the sky and vaporizes the wire. And and but you know, then the problem was, uh, well, I won't describe it because that's kind of the end of the story. So. Well, I, I just have to ask you that I was surprised about the rocket technology. They can reliably induce 
lightning mm. strikes by by basically sending a big wire up into a cloud. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, they, they have to wait till so, so they monitor. It's really an amazing place. It's called the Langmuir uh, Atmospheric Observatory, and it's uh, on top of the South Santa Fe Baldy, down by in the Magdalena Mountains in southern New Mexico, and it's run by uh, New Mexico Tech, which is the school in Socorro, New Mexico, and you drive, you drive up this winding, long dirt road, you know, to get to the top of this mountain at 11,000 feet, and on the peak, you know, like back in the 60s, they excavated these, these underground bunkers, you know, that look like, you know, sort of what you'd expect an underground missile silo to look like, and there's all this equipment down there, and then the Rocketeer, is down down inside here, and, and before they set up like a bunch of rockets in a circle, and they wire them up on on top of the mountain, and then and then the, the guy or woman goes down into the to the bunker, and and, the, and and is monitoring the weather conditions. You know, like you have know, these meters that measure the charge of the atmosphere in kilovolts per centimeter, and when it gets to a certain point, you know they anticipate that it's close enough now that we can probably induce a lightning bolt, because they don't want to wait too long, or because if the lightning bolt happens naturally, you know, then it'll, it'll basically short circuit the sky and they have to wait for it to charge up. And the idea with the rockets then is they want to shoot these things up and then have the lightning be attracted to the ground connection that the rocket's making through this long wire, and, um, and, and that, that way the lightning will come down in a, in a predictable location. They can surround it with meters that measure, like, uh, you know, X-ray intensity and things. So I guess the it, question is, is it, it are the, the physics of the induced lightning significantly different than Well, uh, yeah, that's a, that, that's a big question that they, uh, yeah, they talk about. I mean, they know it's got it's to be, be different because... Uh, you know, it's just, it's just more controlled, and you know, in, the, in this case, you have the, you know, the, in this case, the the downward step leader is going to be hitting a rocket <laughs> right. with a wire leading it to ground, and, and of course, the wire coming up from the ground is carrying carrying positive charge, so it approximates the process. But uh, and they, you know, they figure, you know, it's the closest they've been able to figure out a way to do something like controlled controlled experiments that. But, um, but yeah, but Samaris's attitude was like, well, you know, this is great, and it would be a good proof of principle for the camera to see if I can get the shot, but when he really wants to get, you know, wild lightning in the field and, and get wild that moment lightning. of contact. Wild lightning. I love yeah. that. Can, let yeah. me ask you, you sort of already alluded to this, is I love it when uh, we realize, we're forced to realize that some sort of really ancient, familiar natural phenomenon turns out to be really fucking hard to explain exactly. Yeah. And is, is lightning in, you know, we've all heard about mm. the experiments that Franklin did back in the 18th century. Yeah. And so it seems kind of like this old fashioned stuff that scientists probably would have understood a long time ago, you but think, is that, yeah. that's not the case? It's still fundamentally very All strange? The, you know, and it's really amazing, um, re really rather amazing uh, things that aren't understood. Uh, like, for example, um, you know, you have to have a certain amount of charge, obviously, build up in the sky, so you have a certain amount of electrical potential before the step leader is going to start, you know, seeking... You know, you know the positive charge downward to cancel it out. So, so you can calculate how much, uh, how much um, voltage or difference in charge you're going to need, and there doesn't seem to be, be, be enough. Or, or a better way to put it is between the top of the like the lightning activity tends to start when there's a, a charge difference between the top and the bottom of the cloud, for example, positive and negative. And this potential, uh, you can calculate how. How, how powerful that potential would be and how powerful the potential would be to go from the cloud toward the ground. And, and you, have, you can figure what the resi natural resistance of the air is. And, uh, and, uh, and when you do this, it turns out that the amount of voltage being generated in the clouds isn't nearly enough voltage to theoretically you know, jump the gap and break down the uh, resistance of the air and cause lightning. So... So there's something else. There's some other factor that's missing, and 
you know, one theory is that cosmic rays uh, originally trigger the lightning bolts with this extra little, you know, little boost of charged particles from space. But uh, you know, it's all controversial. But yeah, you know, things like that are another another mystery. Is uh, you know, like lightning, you would think it would always hit like the tallest thing around, especially if you have a, a collection of tall tall metal things. <laughs> Around, but it actually doesn't. You know, it'll just sort of you. Th you think it's going to hit this huge tower, and that instead it'll hit a little tree, you know, a hundred feet away or something. So of course, a lot of that's just the randomness of the of the process. But um, the people who study this stuff are just great. Like there's this whole team at the Langmuir Laboratory, and then throughout most of the summer, they just every day they drive up to the mountain and and do these lightning experiments. And they also send up weather balloons to study lightning, and, um, and they have, uh, it's just really great. Have any <laughs> of them ever been struck by lightning? I don't think any of them have. I mean, they're, they're really careful. And then, and then Samaras, the guy who chases the lightning, has all these meters in his truck that uh, re read out the charge of the atmosphere. And there's even this late, this recorded woman's voice, this electronic computer computer voice that, that calls out so if you're outside you know so usually you'll, you'll be outside of the uh, outside of the trailer and you know he's setting up the stuff inside and everyone's looking around to see where they should where they should aim it and the and the, the regular you know regular as in the photographers taking the pictures for the magazines running around taking pictures and then you'll suddenly hear the lightning lady automatically you know, chiming off uh, how close the lightning strikes are, and and you can see what the charge is on the meter. And, and when it gets to a certain level, you know, everyone is advised to get inside the trailer so um, so you don't get cool. struck. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I uh, I have a funny relationship with lightning. I uh, you know I grew up in a house when I was a kid, a big barn on a a converted barn on a ridge. And uh, it was covered with um, lightning rods, and oh. we were struck all the time. And it and it, when lightning struck the house, it felt like it had been hit by a bomb. There was a huge, ex it, huge bang, and the whole house would would wow. uh, would shudder. And um, when I, you know, that was when I was pretty young. And then I got older, and and there was this house I stayed in in Nantucket with my family. I must have been about thirteen or fourteen. And I, I was in a bedroom at the end of the house, and um, and uh, I was up there one summer, and then uh, I just left. It was was um, I don't know visiting a friend or something, and while I was gone, uh, lightning struck the room I was in, and and actually charred the mattress that I slept on. Really? And, and um, one more one more lightning story. I was in Virginia Beach, friend of mine in high school. Had, his parents had a place down there, and he, invent, he invited, I don't know, maybe uh, four or five of his high school buddies down there, and there was this shack out in back of the main house, and we were all back there, I think, you know, drinking beer, smoking pot, whatever high school boys do, and there was a single uh, light that came down from the ceiling, just a wire with a bare bulb on it and there was this huge electrical storm outside and we were all really getting into it and suddenly the the light the light bulb exploded and there was this gigantic wow. flash in the room and my body was hurled as though this giant Jeez. hand had slapped me against the wall of the shack. Oh my god. It was so I my I guess the the electricity had come down the um this wire and what was weird about it was that it was like a detonation. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't understand the, the physics of that at all, but it was really like a like a yeah. small bomb had gone off in the room. I didn't feel wow. a shock. I just felt uh, it's just, just the mechanic. impact of yeah. God, it sounds like Stephen King. It was really cool. And then the, and then the funny thing was that we all started screaming and yelling, and we ran out of the shack and we ran into the uh, the main house. Where my friend's parents were having this really demure dinner party, <laughs> and so all these shaggy-haired, bloodshot-eyed boys oh, come God. running in, babbling about lightning. And <laughs> oh wow, God, that's great! Yeah, so amazing lightning. stuff. Well, you know, I so kept I, asking people. You know, you know, people talk about ball lightning. Yeah. And um, 
Yeah, everyone I would ask, like I asked Samaris this, and there, and, and, and this other guy, uh, Bill Wynn, who's like the senior lightning researcher at Langmere, and you know, and they all basically was like, well, you know, we don't know. There's definitely what seem like credible reports, and the question is still out on whether whether ball lightning exists, and, and, and lots of people have ball lightning stories of. Uh, and a typical one is one that my grandmother had where she was sitting in the parlor of their house, farmhouse in Missouri one evening, and then a ball lightning came in one window and went out the other window. I've heard versions of that. But yeah, that's know. kind of the classic story. I, I, I didn't know that these reports are not necessarily considered definitive. Well, they... Yeah, you, I mean, there, there's uh, there, there's reports from what I understand that are considered reliable. I didn't really look into ball lightning, but it's still considered controversial. You know, whether it really, you know, I mean, there's, there's not enough observations, and it's never been observed under any kind of, um, you know, I don't want to. I mean, certainly not controlled conditions, but uh, you know, it, it just uh, there's just not enough credible observations, I guess, that they accept it as being definitely real. And also, there's just, you know, really, it would be a real mystery about how this stuff forms. I, this one book I got on lightning science had a little section on ball lightning, and it speculated on different theories. And my favorite one was that the, the ball lightning was a little miniature black hole. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it works for me. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's just great stuff, and boy, it's just so 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 visceral compared to compared to a lot of science these days. You know, I was I just looked back. I, I I'm not sure. Maybe we even talked about this before. I I looked up the uh, the story about Ben Franklin's um, kite experiment, and mm -hmm. uh, you probably know that he. I mean, the, the origins of this are kind of murky. That he he didn't write about it himself, really. The first person to write about it was uh, Joseph Priestley, oh. who uh, who wrote up what he said Franklin had told him about the experiment. I think it was uh, almost 20 years after it supposedly uh, took place. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and uh, it's not clear. You know, some of the details are a little bit hard to uh, believe. So, for example, if, if Franklin had actually been holding the cord, he could have been electrocuted unless, you know, I don't know, if his, shoe, unless his shoes had been very well insulated. Yeah, it just depends on, on, on how good a path, I guess, to ground the yeah. he's providing. Well, and... I think what Priestley said, and this sounds pretty credible, is that Franklin's first sign that the... Um, that uh, something was going on was that he could see uh, threads on the, uh, I'm not sure if it was a string or he could actually see all the way up to the kite that mm -hmm. were electrified and so they were standing apart the way that the hairs on a cat, if it's got uh, static electricity in the fur, stand apart from each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and that also he, you know, the, so there was the key, which apparently was electrified, and and Franklin determined that it was electrified by moving his hand near it, and there'd be a little bit of a ah. you could see a circuit uh, forming between the, um, the oh, key okay. and his skin, but he didn't actually grasp. So Frank, yeah, the, Franklin, you know, being a being a, a pretty smart guy, probably then <laughs> let go of the kite or thought yeah. this this was enough to. You know, it's interesting about Franklin. I always, you know, just mostly through ignorance, just figured that he was just kind of this, uh, you know, gentleman scientist dilettante when it came to things like electricity. But he was really considered, you know, very, very, very respectable lightning researcher in those days. And yeah, I, you know, I guess he's he's credited with having come up with the idea of, or come up with the terms negative and positive right, for the, right. the the opposite yeah. charges. Um, yeah, yeah. There's some yeah. interesting twist on on his view of that. I can't remember what it was, but uh, yeah, and uh, you know, he, you know, he wrote that. Yeah, and, and you know, communicated with Priestley and all of these other other people. And there, there's actually a book just specifically about about, about Franklin's uh, electricity experiments. Um, I, I was just reading about some of his lightning rod experiments. He apparently 
had a, an initial version of it that um, alerted him to when uh, a, stri a strike had occurred that involved uh, a little brass bell that would mm. that would ring, and apparently it drove his wife crazy because when there was a storm, the bell would constantly be ringing, and and it you know made her nervous because she also thought that maybe lightning was was going to incinerate all of them and. Those early days of electrical research were so amazing, and then oh yeah, and then there was you know this real overlap with people like the early electrical researchers thinking that it uh, was connected to the paranormal. Ah, which <laughs> reminds me of something that you wrote recently in Scientific American. Yeah, well, I, actually, that that's kind of an interesting uh, that that good segue, George. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I at the end of June I took my my uh, two teenage children to London to visit my brother. And um, he, it turns out, lives just, just down the street from the Science Museum. This oh, yeah. amazing, really a wonderful museum. One of the, the best parts of it. The uh, in, in Kensington there on Exhibition Road? Yes. Oh, that's and, wonderful. Uh, they've got this wonderful exhibit on the, um, the Industrial Revolution and particularly all these different steam engines, which are, mm -hmm. you know, I actually teach history of technology and I have a section on uh, on uh, steam engines and I've you know I've seen the diagrams and everything but uh, it's just so cool seeing these things yeah. right up right up close they're they're beautiful they're works big big clunky industrial works of art yeah. um, but while I was there there was an exhibit on um, Alan Turing I think it it's his 100th oh, yeah. birthday this year yeah centennial yeah, and um, and uh, yeah, it was all so it had all this stuff. Yeah, it had all this great stuff on. I mean, I didn't realize that he was kind of a hands-on guy too. He helped to build a um, to design and even partially build a uh, a computer in the uh, in the 1940s at a at a British university where he had an appointment mm -hmm. and um, and oh, also yeah. you know, I mean, you meant, like before he was at, at Bletchley Park with the. Enigma yes. machines and right. I yeah. guess so. You know, just to let people know who, who Turing is, he's one of yeah. the people. Yeah, I, I just looked really quickly, and yeah, just to remind me, it, it is yes, yeah, a centennial. Yeah, May, and, May ten to twelve. And Alan Turing is uh, often described as I don't know the Godfather or father of certainly a pioneer of uh, computation. Oh yeah, um, the whole basic co concept of really you know defining computation and. And with yeah. his imaginary Turing machines, it's like probably the most fundamental insight in computer science and the universality so, of computation. And yeah, and he also did, he, he was one of the first people to start thinking about whether computers can think and right, how right. you could possibly determine whether a computer can think. And he came up with this idea called the Turing test, mm -hmm. where you basically have a human and a computer hidden and you feed them questions by uh, typing in the questions and um, based on the answers you try to detect you try to determine uh, which is the computer and which is the uh, the flesh and blood machine yeah. and it's it's still very controversial but really nobody has come up with a better uh, method of determining um, artificial intelligence. Yeah, and, uh, because some people that. would argue that, well, you're just like skimming off the behavior, but then other people would argue, well, you know, <laughs> if you yeah. can do that and it's completely plausible and you can't tell the difference, then, you know, we're... Sure. You know, what does it Why matter? Not? So, yeah, I kind of go both ways on that. But, yeah, Turing was was amazing. And, 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 and the great tragedy of his life is that yeah. uh, he was a closeted homosexual and... Um, he uh, was outed toward the end of his career, and this is after he had been a, a hero yeah. in the British war effort because he had helped to decode uh, the, uh, this German encryption uh, system called Enigma, yeah. and it, it was really a gigantic advance oh, in the huge. Allied effort against the, uh, against the Germans, helped them uh, figure out what the Germans were going to do in advance. Yeah. In some cases, and um, as a result of uh, being convicted of homosexuality, uh, Turing was um, forced to undergo uh, 
what was uh, considered to be a, a kind of cure or for homosexuality. treatments, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hormone treatments, and um, which were uh, humiliating for him and also had various physical effects that were really unpleasant. And he ended up um, almost certainly, he died of arsenic poisoning, and I think it's generally accepted that he, uh, he took his own life. So, yeah, you know. yeah. In fact, yeah. One story that he poisoned a, an apple. <laughs> yeah. And just like sleeping. I mean, snow. Just like you know, the, you know, like the Snow White kind of thing, except you know, deadly. Um, yeah. You know, there's then, a couple of good, really good book. You know, there's Alan Hodge's biography, you know, Turing the Enigma, that was uh, um, inspired a Broadway play, and and then there's this really shorter, very nice. Nice treatment of his life by, by David Levitt, the novelist. Oh, yeah. I, I took a writing class with David Levitt once. Really? Yeah. Wow. Back in the early 80s when he was just up and coming, this, this wow. uh, young gay writer. God, yeah. Well, he's really, yeah. God, so before he was famous. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the, so the, probably the most startling thing that I learned in the Turin exhibit we, you know, because I knew the general contours of his life. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was that he had an interest in um, ESP and paranormal uh, phenomena. Yes, that's fact, what it's really struck me about your column. I didn't know this. Yeah, I, I, had, I had never heard of that either. Um, and uh, what's really cool is in this famous paper he wrote in which he introduced the Turing test, he has this little discussion of the, uh, mm. the implications of ESP for the Turing test. He says it's possible right. if, you know, if you have, a, if you have um, uh, a human with uh, ESP, then it could, uh, it could confound the test in various ways. And so, you know, he sort of discusses that. And he takes that seriously that, as, a, as the objection. So he's, as I recall, he's going through objections Possible yeah. objections to the Turing test, and then there was the argument from ESP. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, I remembered and, that now, yeah. So apparently he was really impressed with experiments done by this guy named Rhine, R-H-I-N-E. Oh, J.B. Uh, Ryan? Yeah. Is that his name? Was, a, was he like the car, little triangles and the different yeah. shapes? And, yeah. And his work impressed a lot of people. Um and, uh, you know, so this is when you have one person, I think that the standard way it's done, and I, I remember doing this when, when, uh, when I was a kid. You have one person who's looking at an array of cards. He had, I think, five cards, different colors and different shapes. And another person is trying to, um, is trying to read that person's mind to see what card they're looking at. Yeah. And, and Ryan claimed that, uh, that people definitely were, could, um, guess what somebody else was looking at at a rate better than chance. And he said that particularly there were some people who uh, had a, a real gift, uh, who were especially good at guessing cards uh, uh, correctly, again, much better than, uh, than chance. And so Turing took these results very seriously. And, um, and it just reading this about Turing, it reminded me of uh, some other famous people who, um, scientists, yeah. Uh, who have taken ESP very seriously. Not necessarily that they believed in it, but yeah. that they thought that the evidence was very suggestive and mm -hmm. that it was worth investigating further. Uh, so I just wrote a post for Scientific American about some of these folks. And it includes William James, who's one of my um, yeah. intellectual heroes, who was uh, very impressed with a, a medium in the late 19th century named Leonora yeah. Piper, who claimed that she could channel um, uh, ghosts and mm -hmm. could could uh, divulge facts that she couldn't possibly have known in any other way. At least this right. is what James concluded. Um, Sigmund Freud, this kind of surprised me, uh, you know, because he's such a notorious hard ass and skeptic, especially about anything spiritual or religious. But apparently, he privately he didn't really like talking about it in public. Um, thought that uh, he had experienced telepathy with, among others, um, his daughter, Anna Freud. Oh, uh, yeah. they, they carried out some long-range experiments. Um, 
and uh, Freud thought that they were uh, successful. Yeah. Um, another person, I mean, everybody's, everybody knows about uh, Jung, but, uh, and Jung, his belief yeah. in synchronicity, synchronicity and, and all that stuff, but Jung also had a fascinating correspondence with Wolfgang uh, Pauli, yeah. a Nobel Prize winning physicist, who again had a reputation for being very, very tough and destroying. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. What do they call him? The wrath of God? That's how he signed his letters? <laughs> right. The scourge of God? But he apparently went through a period when he had a nervous breakdown and was very distressed and had strange dreams. And he went to Jung uh, for uh, therapy. Yeah. And uh, Jung interpreted Pauli's dreams and uh, convinced Pauli that there might really be something uh, to synchronicity. Um, and uh, just two other people I'll mention in the uh, in the present: uh, Freeman Dyson. I think we might have discussed the fact yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that he believes in ESP. The, you know, this great physicist. On the other yeah. hand, Dyson is such a contrarian that I, I I suspect him of saying he believes in ESP just to irritate people. <laughs> Um, and one more uh, interesting case, Brian Josephson, who won a oh, Nobel yeah. Prize, I think younger at, a, at an earlier age than any other so-called hard scientist for discovering something called the Joseph, Josephson effect, this very peculiar quantum uh, phenomenon. Yeah. And, um, and he had a kind of nervous breakdown, at least this is what he told me, in his late 20s, and after that he... He had these visions, and it convinced him that uh, that ESP and other paranormal phenomena are uh, are real. Oh, but then, but then later he was convinced it was just the result of a nervous breakdown, or no, no, he still believes in it. He, he still, still writes all these oh, letters. Okay. So the to... nervous, it was a nervous breakdown that led to this great breakthrough. Yes. Yes, he blew out the doors of perception. Right. Yeah. And well, you know, there was yeah, then there was the, the, like the electrical guys. Um, like uh, well, uh, Crooks, you know, the guy that uh, did all the early uh, these early experiments with uh, with cathode ray tubes and things, and he thought the you know where you take like an evacuated tube and put a big voltage across it, and you get this glowing uh, glowing plasma, you know, luminous plasma of uh, well, depending on on the strength of the vacuum, it can be anywhere from purple to the green, and, and uh, he was speculating that this was ectoplasm, you know, the stuff that ghosts are made of. And, and then J.J. Thompson, who, you know, discovered the charge mass ratio of the electron. I read a really interesting essay report that he wrote where he went to a seance, but he, his, he, he, he was debunking, debunking it. And then, you know, it was one of the early people like, uh, like, the, the, like the magician, the amazing Randy, who would... Uh, Basically, show how there were all these plausible, plausible, uh, perfectly natural mechanistic ways in which someone could have pulled this off. And then, unless you could prove that it hadn't happened that way, that it was quite a leap to you know, say you were communicating with the spiritual, spiritual world. Yeah, and, and Randy has a standing offer for somebody who can demonstrate. Yeah. Psi phenomenon, uh, a psi phenomenon to his satisfaction. And, you know, yeah. of course, the true believers say this is a bogus offer. But, uh, you know, that, that, but it's basically why I'm not a believer. I, I figure if it's real, it it's something that can be demonstrated and, um, and replicated. Yeah. And it just hasn't been. Yeah. I mean, if it's not subtle. <laughs> yeah. And now, yeah, of course, no, you know, that's, that's where I'm at with that too. But boy, you know, you meet so many people, people that you would never expect who are just convinced based on some personal experience that, you know, this is true. And you yeah. know, they, there are two attitudes, I guess. One is that science will eventually uncover this, and, and it can only happen under very, 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 very specialized conditions, which you know, always has to make you kind of, kind of suspicious, but. You know, yeah. then again, you know, there's a lot of things in, like, science where, you know, when you really get to the realms of high-energy physics where something can happen only under these very rare, rare conditions. Yeah, it reminds me of what um, I think Richard Feynman said about um, string theory, uh, that string theorists don't make predictions, they make excuses. 
Um, <laughs> and I think you could you could say the same thing about uh, parapsychology. Uh, well, yeah, you know. it's like the efficacy of prayer studies, you know, like that big one that the Templeton Foundation did, and then and then it seemed to show that uh, like a triple blind experiment and, and, and cardiac patients who were prayed for by um, other people anonymously so that, you know, the patients didn't know who was being prayed for and the doctors didn't know who, which patients were being prayed for and the, and the, uh, the, prayer, the prayers didn't know which patients they were praying for. So triple blind experiment, and then it came out showing that the cardiac patients that were being prayed for had a slightly greater chance of, uh, of dying than, than the others. I mean, you know, it was one of these things where it was just such a small, little, tiny... Oops. Difference. <laughs> basically, what the study said was that there was no difference. But uh, so if I'm sick, I yeah, you know, the first thing I tell my relatives is, whatever you do, don't pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> it can only hurt. <laughs> yeah, I would still, I would still be of the mind that it can't hurt. But yeah, um, yeah, but I, I do think I, uh, I have been at scientific conferences and had these private conversations with people, and I do think that many more scientists believe or at least are open-minded about even ghosts and shit like that yeah. uh, than, uh, than, um, than sort of mainstream science, kind of like the AAAS version of uh, science would have the public believe. Well, uh, that's, I, well I, yeah, I found, that's interesting. But, yeah, but, but, I, but, but, but their, um, their, their take on that would be, you know, they're not ruling it out, and if you know, if the evidence does emerge, this implies that there's some kind of um, physical reason for explaining this. Even if you're having to posit some some new force or some some weird quantum thing, that, uh, that you know, it would go from being supernatural to natural. It would Entanglement. Just expand, you know what we know about the natural realm. Entanglement is like fairy dust that you can <laughs> sprinkle over this humdrum world and make it all magical and filled with uh, all sorts of fantastical things. Yeah, like you can explain consciousness with quantum mechanics because they're both so mysterious. Yes, yeah. right. Okay. Just in the way that you were saying was done with electricity, say, a hundred years ago when electricity was still really strange and Yeah, it was ghost and stuff. And, uh, yeah, and then they slowly it became, you know, they came up with this, you know, well, in fact, there are these invisible little particles called electrons, and they're not really particles, they're actually waves, and they're not really waves, they're waves of probability, and, um, and they're all identical, so you can think of it as there only being one electron in the universe in different states, and yeah, <laughs> right. so nice solid, solid explanation. But, uh, yeah, ac electrons, maybe they're, you know, the ghosts of... Uh, of uh, people from another universe, from a Maybe. parallel world. Yeah. Um, and listen, as long as we're talking pseudoscience, <laughs> okay. you know, in, in our remaining time, do you want to fill us in on the great fluoridation controversy oh, of Santa Fe? Oh, yeah, Bay? thanks. Um, I mean, this is so strange. Did you know that this was still considered by some people to be a burning issue, whether <laughs> no. you should fluoridate uh, public water supplies to prevent tooth enamel uh, I don't think and tooth decay? I don't think I did unless, you know, um, unless you might have mentioned it to me a while ago, but I didn't realize no, it was I just so discovered serious. It. I, was, uh, I, I picked up our local newspaper one day and read that the city council had uh, voted to stop fluoridating water. Uh -huh. and, I thought, and then I read some of the testimony from the people who showed up at the meeting, and it just sounded like something you'd hear from the John Birch Society in the 60s, you know, where fluoridation was a communist conspiracy to pollute our precious bodily fluids. And, uh, and, and then I looked into it more, and, and there's actually a big group called the, the Fluoride Action Network. And if they get wind of our little blogging heads conversation, we'll be bombarded, both of us, with email, email from them, um, you know, repeating the, uh, you know, what they think are legitimate scientific claims from their website. But, and we'll get emails, I'm sure, from listeners who say that uh, we're putting too much faith in the technocracy and the experts, and there's all this case against fluoride. But what it comes down to, basically, is, is recently the uh, Health and Human Service Department 
has been, you know, revisited its standard of fluoridation. And the standard now is they recommend that community water systems, you know, they recommend, they don't, you know, make them do this, as a lot of the opponents seem to believe, but they recommend that the fluoride level should be somewhere between 0 0.7 and 1.2 milligrams per uh, per liter, which is one, one, point, uh, one, one part per billion is a better way to say it. So what one part per billion, um, and, and, and some communities have way, way more fluoride than that. And it was these communities back in the 1940s that people, you know, started comparing notes, and, and, and they got the sense that people in these high fluoride communities were getting less, uh, uh, significantly fewer cavities, like some of the old reports say 40% fewer, but you know, these weren't very well controlled, you know, this wasn't modern epidemiology, which has enough problems. But, um, but anyway, this became, you know, really this consensus, and there have been many studies over, over the years that have, um, you know, supported this. And uh, so they recommended that, that uh, the standard be uh, 0 0.7 to, uh, to uh, 1.2. So recently, you know, after doing this big study uh, um, in, 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 in getting together with the EPA and and uh, they decided, well, you know, people are getting a lot of fluoride now that they didn't used to get from toothpaste mm -hmm. and things like this and fluoride mouthwashes. And, and maybe we don't, maybe we can lower, lower it just to, instead of saying 0 0.7 to 1.2, uh, just say 0 0.7. Because the downside of fluoridation is at some point, if fluoride gets too high, you can get this uh, cosmetic condition called flor fluoridosis where... Um, it's it's like a it's like a, a staining of the teeth, you know. And some I've people it. consider yeah. it a problem, and some people don't. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you've seen someone who grew up in an area with high fluoride, there's nothing nothing at all unattractive about it, I don't think. But I'm sure it comes in different levels, and and so that's the downside. And and, and uh, so the other uh, thing that's opened up this this um, can of worms is that the um, a study by the National Academy of Sciences, uh, uh, they, they were asked by the EPA to, eval to validate the, I mean, to evaluate the EPA's fluoride standard, which was for entirely different reasons. This was how high a level of natural fluoride in the water uh, uh, should be set as the standard. And the EPA had said four parts per billion, and that above that there was a slight risk of fluoridosis, and of course more as it increased. And then the, um, the NAS uh, has recommended that they lower that to two. So basically, there's the, the recommended standard for dental stuff is 0 0.7, and 2.0 is the is they think they say, well, don't go don't go that high because a few people might get fluoridosis. And and um, so just based on all that, it's opened up this um, this campaign and this idea that scientists are are uh, you know, uh, some people say the scientists are recognizing that fluoride is actually bad for you, but then they start looking at studies that, you know, as with anything, you can find studies correlating with, you know, really high levels of fluoride with all kinds of bad things. Yeah. You know, cancers and mental retardation, and and uh, and and so they they leave out, you know, a lot of the details, and the message is basically, you know, well, look, God, you know the. EPA's uh, lowering the fluoride standard and the and the uh, HHS and then and then it turns out there's this other study here from you know villages in China showing that villages with really high you know like in some cases tens to hundreds to over a thousand parts per billion of fluoride in their water are are having problems with fluoridosis and then they'll make the next leap and say, oh, and there are these studies that, you know, say that, you know, there's some chance correlating this with, uh, you know, with uh, a bladder cancer, you know, just like, you know, you can find a study that will, you know, correlate. It really reminds me of the whole cell phone microwave brain tumor thing where you can find these outlier studies. And they put this all together into this really slick website and uh, this very coordinated effort. So... What I learned is you write anything about this, as I did on my blog, the Santa Fe Review, and you're immediately bombarded with kind of this mix of mostly really sarcastic emails, like, you know, you, you stupid journalists upholding the scientific establishment. And they're really persuaded that they have found 
some smoking gun study, or they have understood the evidence in a way that's eluded the entire public health community. And, yeah. um, well, and, and George, it's either eluded them or is being suppressed because it's a conspiracy. George, I mean, <laughs> do you want to do you want to divulge your connections, your your enormous payoffs from the fluoride industry at this point, uh, mm. you know, just in the interest of transparency. Yeah, well, you know, one of the one of the conspiracy theories is that um, since fluoride is an industrial waste, and there are, and uh, there are restrictions against disposing of fluoride waste by industry, <laughs> that this is a conspiracy for the chemical industry to get rid of their fluoride, so they don't <laughs> they don't even have to pay to get rid of this stuff. They can make what? dentists buy it. One part per billion. Um, yeah, in the yeah right. One part per billion. You could really expose of a lot of fluoride at that level. <laughs> you know, again, we're talking about you know the hazardous waste of you know just vastly you know, or, you know orders of magnitude more than this, and and then uh, and then people take this study. So it, it was interesting looking into this. You know, it was all many things I didn't know. Like uh, like in China, there are these villages where. You know, it's just a big problem nationwide that people from certain areas have, you know, really severe fluoridosis, mm -hmm. you know, this cosmetic condition in their teeth. And then all these studies have been done comparing different levels of water. And they did you know, do these studies and correlating it with IQ. And they found uh -huh. that these villages um, that had uh, really high fluoride levels, that there was possibly a correlation where it would appear if the statistics were right, to shave a few points off the average IQ. Even well, though I would imagine if the levels of fluoride in the water are high, they're probably, uh, God knows, what other natural toxins in the water exactly. as well. Exactly, yeah. yeah, and the socioeconomic things and differences. Yeah. And, and, and then, then there was this one big meta-analysis that pooled a bunch of these studies, and basically... You know, you know, came out saying, well, you know, we do show that there's a statistically significant connection between high fluoride levels, you know, not the levels that are recommended for for dental stuff, and um, and and the slight effect on the IQs. But then the study goes on when you really read it to say that this could be, we realize this could be within the range of experimental error. And, uh, you know, all these caveats, which, of course, gets washed over, too. So then you add that into the mix, and I found a quote from some, well, like in Florida, the county that includes St. Petersburg, uh, Tampa, this huge population area recently was persuaded, uh, the city council was persuaded to stop flor fluoridating the water. And I found a news story, this one man said it was a conspiracy by the government to put fluoride in the water to make us stupid so we're easier to govern. <laughs> I don't know. That that actually sounds like a pretty good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that that one rings true, huh? Yeah. I could explain but anyway, the tea I was party. just flabbergasted to find that you know this this issue has has not been laid to rest. And oh. listen, I bet. Here's a thought. Um, I bet if you look at the um, the people that are part of this anti fluoride uh, campaign, that they would have unusually high levels of fluoride in uh, their system, which would uh, might explain um, oh. their uh, their views of science. Might, it might, it might, it might cause this anti-science view. Yeah. Um, I mean, so much of this is just, you know, people start looking into science and they expect there's going to be like one smoking gun study where the way I described it in my blog is where you take identical twins and take them from their parents at birth and raise one with with a certain level of fluoride in the water and another without fluoride. And, and of course there's not. You know, there's like one epidemiological study after another. They're all imperfect and, uh, you know, have their weaknesses and their strengths. And over the years, this accumulated evidence has convinced, uh, you know, the American Association of Public Health, the American Dental Association, that this is a good idea to, you know, to recommend that there be this threshold amount of fluoride and, Right. And they're saying now that, well, you know, people are probably getting more fluoride than before, so let's back off a little just to be conservative to several times lower than the standard that's believed to believe to risk fluoridosis. And yeah, it leaves me a little ambivalent because, uh, you know, I, I love um, trying to find flaws in uh, mainstream scientific positions. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, I like that too. 
But this sounds kind of like Tea Party-ish somehow. It, oh, it is Tea Party-ish. 